Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. Today, my guest is Perry Marshall. I read Perry's book, 8020 Sales and Marketing, a few years ago, and it changed my entire way of looking at my business and my life. I can point to several substantial and permanent changes I've made in my business because of his book, and it's a privilege to have him on the show today. Perry, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Happy to be talking to you. Hello from Chicago to Boston. So, All right. Well, we want to dive into your book history and your career as an author. But before we get there, give us a little more background on who you are as a person, where you came from, what were some of the events that shaped you in your life? So... I'm a pastor's kid from Lincoln, Nebraska, studied electrical engineering, uh, married my high school sweetheart, moved to Chicago. And uh, when Laura was about three months pregnant with our first child, I got laid off from my engineering job. And if I wanted to stay in Chicago, I had to like do something different. And so I ended up in sales. And that was a rather rude awakening. And I guess you could say that. 80 20 sales and marketing is a bunch of stuff I wish I knew when I was 26 uh, and like thrown into the lake and expected to swim. Um, in, in fact, there's a lot of layers to that. So, for example, um, we made a, a rather sophisticated um, te- a tool uh, called the marketing DNA test, uh, which is extremely accurate. And it it helps you figure out how do you actually persuade in the first place? Like, I I believe that people have a go-to default way that they get other human beings to cooperate with them. And some people, like, they get up on a stage and they bang a drum and they get everybody excited about it. And other people do it with spreadsheets and graphs and charts. And, like, these are completely different ways of being in the world. And so, like, when I was in sales um, and, and, like, cutting my teeth, I would listen to these, like, Zig Ziglar and Tom Hopkins tapes. And I would read these books and they would give you these formulas But the formula, it took me a long time to figure out that formula will only work for a certain kind of person. Okay. And and there, and so um, you know, it it only took me 20 years to figure this out, right? (laughs) But um, I, I started to figure out really everybody enlists cooperation from other people, like everybody who gets anywhere in life. You know, and and it's not like there are some personalities that could just never be successful. There's all kinds of like the world is just full of all kinds of crazy personalities that manage to do what they're trying to do, but they they figure out how to do it their way. And so I think people can bypass years of pain and suffering and toil and rejection and frustration and self recrimination, right? Like like, why can't I, what's the matter with me? Why can't I do this? Well, maybe you're not supposed to be doing this. And, and, and the, the whole idea of 80-20, which we can get into, is that the starting point is what you're not going to do. And the starting point is who you're not going to sell to. And the starting point is what you're not going to sell in the first place. And so uh, that, that, that is so important. And, and I think, uh, you know, all of us with very good intentions, we admire people that are out there doing stuff. And we go, I want to do that. Or I want to be like that. And that's great up to a point. But you got to really figure out, you know, who you admire just because it's admirable and who you really try to imitate. Now, 8020 wasn't the first book that you wrote, though. So tell us a bit about your journey before that and how that led to your other books. Um, when I was, so I went through a few iterations. I finally found a job in marketing that actually worked for me. And, and I was basically a sales and marketing manager and I'm sending emails and I'm talking to people on the phone about hardware and software and stuff. 
And my boss was asked to write a magazine article for a trade magazine. And, and his friend said, oh, Mike, this is like a golden opportunity because if a magazine, you know, like this is like the best kind of publicity you could get. It's like editorial space in a magazine. And so he did it. And he ground his way through that. Mike was not a writer. He did not enjoy writing. And when he got done, he goes, man, never again. I, I, I know in theory that was a great thing to do, but, 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 but that, that was like tearing my hair out. He goes, Harry, if you ever want to write magazine articles, I'll pay you 500 bucks. And I go, hang on a second. You will? <laughs> and Josh, you, you've been in this business. So... You, That's like a dream come true. It's like, wait, you're going to pay me to do something I like doing already? Right. And, and so like, uh, you know, I might latch on to that. And I did. Well, so I started doing that. And it was like, at, at the time, I mean, I got a wife and two or three kids and they're, you know, like babies at home and young guy, late 20s, scrapping, trying to make things happen. And so like an extra 500 bucks on top of my base and my commission, that yeah. Oh yeah. Like that makes a difference. So, so I started doing that and it worked and he was happy to be paying me for that. And one day I get this phone call from a book acquisitions editor at one of these uh, at it. Well, it was at ISA, which is a professional society for process engineers. And he goes, we need somebody to write an ethernet book and I like your articles. And I go, well, I don't know anything about Ethernet. I know about all these other networks. And he goes, well, we don't want a book on these other networks. We want an Ethernet book. And I like your writing style. So if you want it, you got it. Um, and I'm like, uh, okay. And so I, I ended up learning Ethernet so I could write a book. But see, I knew. I knew that the guy that writes the book has a level of authority. And I already knew from writing all those magazine articles that if I'm the first guy to write a book on Ethernet for the industrial space, which was the case, then I'm like first mover advantage and like the default thought leader. And so, you know, yeah, Perry, it's, it's a real pain in the butt to go do this project, write a book. In fact, you got to research the thing to death before you can write the book. But if you do this, that's probably a good idea. And so I did. And so my book, Industrial Ethernet, which is, it is a page turner. I'm telling you, you are going to love this book. You know, it's all about how ones and zeros go back and forth on the internet, basically. Well, so I, I, I wrote this book and it did open doors for me. Like there's a, after I hung out my shingle, there's a client I got that I'm almost certain I wouldn't have got if I hadn't wrote that book. It was like, okay, he's one of us. He knows like how many marketing guys understand that, right? And so it, it, it definitely helped me. Now, what's interesting, I think, even more than all of that is that I had no idea at the time, but if you fast forward in the future, that book was going to be a little tiny, but absolutely necessary doorway for me to be able to write my Evolution 2.0 book, which is about evolutionary biology and genetic code. And it was like, <laughs> this, is a, this is a field where nobody is interested in another outsider showing up and telling them something new. Like evolutionary biology is one of the most resistant to evolution fields that there is. Um, they really like their tired old stories. And, um, but the fact that I had written an ethernet book for the world's largest society of process control engineers meant this guy absolutely knows what he's talking about when it comes to ones and zeros, and so you can't just dismiss him. And, um, and one thing led to another over 15 years, and now it's the world's largest science prize for basic research. It's 10 times the size of Nobel, $10 million um, technology prize. So um, I guess 
if there's a theme in this, it's that I found, so writing and explaining things is how I sell. I sell by teaching and that would open these little doors and I would just keep open. Like when a door would swing open, I would walk through it. And then another door would open and I would walk through it. And you end up very, very far from where you ever would have imagined 15 or 20 years later. Well, we've already talked about Ethernet and evolutionary biology. Help us connect these to marketing. How did you get from that to 8020 sales and marketing in your other marketing books? Well, so when I was so remember, I, I got laid off from my job. I took a sales job, and that sales job was two years of struggle and bitter rum and soup and and bologna sandwiches and Velveeta and pounding the phone and trying to it was just miserable. And I wandered into a seminar where Dan Kennedy was speaking. And he was talking about direct marketing and he levitated 300 bucks out of my wallet and I bought his magnetic marketing thing. And the way I would describe that was, so this was hardcore, classic, old school, direct marketing with a sort of Dan Kennedy cult twist to it. Okay. That's really what it was. All right. Now, the way I would describe it is, Direct marketing is marketing by and sometimes even for engineers. Okay, so direct marketers are like the propeller heads of marketing. They're not the guys doing the talking sock videos uh, in the Super Bowl commercial. They're the guys with a pen and a pencil and spreadsheet and a calculator. And they're like, okay, so, you know, we mailed out 10,000 letters and then we got you know, 1.7% of the people to respond. And then we sold X number of stuff and we had an ROI of X and everything is a process. And it was like, I get this. This actually makes sense. Like what Zig Ziglar says to the lady to sell her pots and pans does not really make sense to me. I don't even know why I would go sell pots and pans, right? I don't like all those manipulative closes and everything like it's just not me that that makes sense and, and so i started to learn direct marketing well this is in 1997 well what was hap what was about to happen in 1997 the internet was about to go you know kablam out and so i got fired from that job but i took this other job in this job, hardware, software company, we had a website. Like my old job didn't have a website. My old job was like call somebody on the phone and go see them, right? The old school propeller head engineer who's like tracking everything. All of a sudden, you take that guy and you put him on internet marketing and he's the king of the world. Okay. Like Mark Zuckerberg or Larry and Sergey or Jeff Bezos would have never made it in the 80s. Okay, but in all of a sudden in the 2000s, like these are the new rules. And so, I mean, I just took to that like a duck in water and and it was like the greatest magic carpet ride. And at first it was just, well, I know a little bit more about this direct marketing stuff than most other people. And so I'm ahead of the curve, right? Um, well, then... Then it things got interesting because I hung out my shingle, which is whole story, um, and and became a consultant. And six months later, Google's advertising system came along, and Google introduced Google AdWords, and now the entire English language was for sale. You can bid on any phrase on a search engine, and you know what's funny was it took a while. It, it actually took a couple of years for the world to figure out that this was a big deal. Um, they did not take to it right away. But you I, had the background to see this and say, wait a second, this is exactly what I do. Yes. If you, if, so I had, I had learned 
basically I'd learned the basics of mail order marketing, right? And, and print advertising, you know, which has been around for a hundred years. I, I, I learned that. And I remember this reading an article where this guy said that the world just did a 180. He said, it used to be that the marketers and the salespeople were chasing the customers. He goes, now with the internet, the customers are chasing the marketing and salespeople because they're typing things into a search engine and looking for stuff. And you can get in front of them. I'm like, yes, I get it, right? And like the first uh, internet marketing seminar I went to, this guy showed a keyword tool where you could see how many searches there were for plumber and how many searches there were for plumber unstop my toilet and you know all of these kind of things. And, and I was like, wow, okay, so I understand the internet from behind the curtain instead of from the audience. And so I'm going to go back there and I'm going to start, you know, pulling the levers. So, um, so this just became incredible. And, and so I wrote a book called The Definitive Guide to Google AdWords. And probably two months after that book came out, though, the world of Google advertising hit critical mass because what happened was affiliates started figuring out, hey, I can go sign up for an affiliate program and go bid on keywords, drive traffic, be an invisible arbitrage traffic broker and actually make money. And it sounds crazy, but it actually works. It, it worked really well when keywords were cheap, by the way. It doesn't work nearly as well now. But um, I like, my book landed in the middle of that and I was very well prepared. I mean, I had become a very diligent student of, of all of this because it's an entire profession. And I said, I'm going to know, I don't want anybody to ever stump me. Like I want a deep bag of tricks. And so I just pursued that. And so it was like catching the touchdown pass. And so I put this book out and well, to make a long story short, it became the best-selling book on internet advertising. And uh, it's in a sixth edition now. It's called Ultimate Guide to Google Ads. So, so okay, so how does this get you 80-20? Well, well, hey, before you go into 80-20, I'm curious. So you said that that book is in its sixth edition, mm -hmm. but you also have this book about Ethernet and you have this book about evolutionary biology. Were you struggling during this time keeping your personal brand straight? I mean, do you still get people asking you about Ethernet stuff and you're like, yeah, I don't really want to be the Ethernet guy anymore? I mean, what was happening during this time as you had these books out there doing this work for you, sending you traffic that maybe you had grown out of in a sense? Well, so, so when I hung out my shingle, I said, I am, I am a B2B marketing consultant. And for about two years, I made most of my bread from industrial networking. Okay, so this, there's actually a huge lesson here. And the lesson is about being a big fish in a little pond. Okay, so most people define themselves too broadly. Even freelancers and consultants and, and people like that. They're like, oh, I, well, I could make you a website and I could do your advertising and I could do this and I could do that. But there are 10,000 other people that can do those things. And even if you're better at those things than everybody else, which you're probably not, <laughs> but even if you are, nobody knows why they should pick you instead of somebody else. The reason my clients picked me was I understood industrial networking and I could prove it. I knew the language, I knew the customers, I knew, I knew the vendors, like I knew the whole space. I knew, unquestionably knew it better than anybody else who was wearing a direct marketing hat. And so, you know, all you need is two or three or four clients. You can make a living. And so this is what I did. Well, so I'm doing that and I'm putting groceries on the table. But then, On the side, I'm building this uh, subject matter expert as a marketer 
and knowing marketing. And what happened was Google fell in my lap. And all of a sudden, it's like six months later, I wake up and I'm a Google expert. And there aren't hardly any other Google advertising experts anywhere. And so this became a much bigger deal than the previous thing. And it just kind of swept the other one aside eventually. Okay. And so now I was just the Google guy to a bunch of, to a whole bunch of marketing people. I was just the Google ads guy. And so what, ha what happened was for literally 10 years, I was perfectly content to be pigeonholed as the Google ad guy, even though I could do a whole lot of other things. And so I want you to notice the pattern. First, I'm the industrial networking marketing guy, and then I'm the Google advertising guy. And in both cases, it was big fish, little pond, or little fish, tiny pond. And I can't tell you how important that is. Um, you carve out an identity in, in something that's so small that there is nobody else. That is a much better formula for success than uh, knowing how to do 100 things. That is a great lesson. With your uh, book being in its sixth edition, I'm also curious, do you revise those yourself every time or do you have people who help you with that? How do you get those revisions done? I eventually switched to co-authors. So at first couple of editions, it was mostly me. But um, as time went on, uh, you know, the 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 business of knowing a topic and the business of promoting a topic are really two different things. And, you know, back in the early days, Google was actually simple enough that one person could keep track of it all. It's not anymore. Okay. It's a huge subject. It's, it's like a, it's like a jumbo jet airline cockpit with like all of these things. Right. And so, for Google, I have Mike Rhodes, and for Facebook, I have Bob Rignaris and a couple other guys, and they really know what they're talking about. And so my name's on the cover, but I'm not actually the Google expert anymore, and I'm not actually the Facebook expert anymore. Yeah, this is how I, I feel like a book is kind of like running a business or starting a business. You start a business and then you hire people to help you as it grows. It seems like with a book that has legs like this, it's kind of similar. You you build that book and you get it started, but then at some point you say, you know what, I need help. I need other people. There's too much here. And so you bring other people in kind of as employees. You call them co-authors. And you win because the book keeps coming out. They win because they get their name on a book that's established and already has an audience. And right. so it's good for everybody. Yes, it totally is good for everybody. And for all these guys, this is one of the best career moves they ever made. And it was a ton of work. Like doing a Google Ads book is a crap ton of labor. Especially these days, because I remember when I got into Google Ads years ago, it wasn't that bad. Now I look at it and I'm like, nope, I got to hire somebody to do this for me. There's no right. way. Right. And so, um, and that's just, that's how the world evolves as it gets more complex and, 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 and you just work with it. And, uh, and so, yeah, my, my role in the world has changed a lot over time. Quick break here. Are you an entrepreneur? Do you want to write a book that will help you grow your business? Visit PublishedAuthor.com, where we have programs to fit every budget, programs that will help you write and publish your book in as little as 90 days, starting at just $39 per month. Or if you're too busy to write your book, we'll interview you and then write and publish your book for you. Don't let the valuable knowledge and experience you have go to waste. Head on over to PublishedAuthor.com to get the help you need to become a published author. You've already waited long enough. Do it today. Now, back to the show. All right. So let's get up to 8020 Sales and Marketing. What was the inspiration for that book? You said part of it was talking to your 26-year-old self and saying, this is what I wish I would have learned. But what was that point when you said, this is the book, and this is the book I'm going to write. I need to write this book. So I had a big epiphany about 8020 in about 2003. And um, I realized that 
for the first time. This is one of the most important things you could ever learn. Like it is, it is so powerful. If you really have 80, 20 under your belt, it's better than reading like 25 other marketing books. And so it became the basis for how I solved Google ads. So like when, when Google ads was new, it's like they invented this thing and a bunch of engineers put it together, but okay. So what is the process that you use in order to build a marketing campaign, all that kind of stuff? Well, nobody knew. Well, I said 80-20 is how you know. You, you, you start looking at all this data you're generating and you start asking, what is the 20% of this data that is making 80% of the difference? And what is the 20% of the traffic that's getting 80% of the clicks and 80% of the sales? What are the 5% of the keywords that are generating 95% of the traffic? And, and, and because there's this huge amount of data, you have to chisel this down. It's 80, 20 tells you, yes, 10% of this data is way more important than the other 90%. This is all a game of figuring out what to ignore and what to pay attention to. And so I started teaching 80, 20 in little bits and pieces along the way. So I would get these Google customers. I always had a chapter in my book about 80-20. I would talk about it a little bit. And when I would get customers into coaching programs and trainings and workshops, I would really teach them 80-20 uh, properly. And it always helped them. And so I knew that it worked once somebody newly knew me, liked me, trust, trusted me. Now the experiment was, can I lead with 80-20? If I explain this different than anybody else has ever explained it to them, um, like, will that sell as a book? And well, the answer was, I don't know, but I'm going to try. And so we wrote this book. And the thing that I liked about the book was my Google book is about somebody else's platform. Okay, it's about Google and Google will regularly change the rules, shoot a whole bunch of advertisers dead and throw their bodies into a ditch. Um, and, you know, it's nice that I can use their platform to teach people this stuff, but I am not passionate about Google. I want something that I can kind of make my own. And, and so I did that with 8020. Well, it turns out that it was well received and people did like the book. They loved the stories in the book. They liked the way I explained it. And so it's become uh, an evergreen marketing classic. I mean, it's been out for eight years and it just consistently sells and sells and consistently people like, oh my goodness, I never knew this before. And now, now I have this, it's like what you said, well, I have this whole other way of seeing my business now. That's cool. I never thought of that. So, so I guess I'm just very happy. And, and you know, sometimes you put things out there and sometimes the world understands them and thinks they're great, and sometimes they don't. And and that's that's just being an author. Mm -hmm. What was your first introduction to the whole concept of eighty twenty? Was it Richard Koch, or was it Pareto Principle, or when did no, you first was, become introduced to the idea? Well, it wasn't Richard Koch. It was something before that. It might have even been Ben J. Abraham, but somebody said. 20% of your customers generate 80% of your invoices and 80% of your customers only generate 20%. And I was like, is that right? And I went and I ran a QuickBooks report. It was like, sure enough, this is actually true. And then I didn't do anything about it. Okay. Like I didn't really get it. It didn't really click. And um, well, then I, then I read Richard Kosh's book and on page 14, he says, just a throwaway comment. He, he, he goes, 80, 20 has a lot to do with fractals and chaos theory. And then he just moves on. He doesn't say anything else about it. Well, that happened to be a rabbit hole. I had been down. Um, if, if you want an interesting, like YouTube trip, go to YouTube and type in fractals and chaos and like watch videos for 45 minutes and you'll find 
oh, there's this whole world of repeating patterns in nature that operate at every level of scale. So a tree is fractal. A tree has a branching pattern, whether like a, there's a tree across the street and it looks like it's 50 feet tall and, you know, but I can, I can zoom in to the veins in the leaf with, with a magnifying glass and I still see the branching pattern. So that's what fractal means. And it was like, hey, wait a minute. He's saying that 8020 is a pattern that repeats at every level of scale. And if that's true, that means there's an 8020 inside every 8020, and then there's another one and another one and another one and another one. Well, any time, okay. So I knew anytime you encounter that, you are dealing with a core fundamental pattern of nature that most people don't even know about. I'm like, really? Hey, wait a minute. Let me go look. Is this, is this true? And it was true. And the interesting thing, hardly anybody was talking about it. I mean, people, business people would talk about 80-20. And then you go, if in academic literature, they had this very obtuse thing called an 80-20 distribution, which you had to have, understand calculus to even use it at all. And I was like, nobody is making this simple and understandable for people. Um, and so, so I, I said, I'm going to explain this properly. I'm going to help people understand that not only do 20% of your customers generate 80% of your revenue, 20% of the 20% of the 20% generate 80 of the 80 of the 80. So there are huge levers in marketing if you like, push certain buttons. And this doesn't just apply to customers. It pretty much applies to everything in your whole business. Like anything that could be put into a spreadsheet, anything that could be measured, you know, uh, defects of products or or support tickets in your support desk or or um, sources of traffic or sources of revenue or shoplifting, all of it, all of it is 80-20. And so it's like, if you have an 80-20 filter, it's like you take your funny colored 80-20 glasses and you put it on and like some things just become invisible and other things are like in sharp relief. You're like, okay, that's important. That's important. That's important. Fix these three things and your whole business gets better. And you know, and there's all these other problems you don't even have to think about. Right. And, and so most of the time when people get this, they really get it. They're like, oh my word, how did I never see this before? They're talking to their wife about it and they're talking to their clients about it. And so it's just a really cool thing. And I, I think it's pretty much the most useful thing you could ever learn in business. Right. Cause it cuts down the effort. I mean, it allows you to focus on the stuff that matters rather than focusing your attention on a bunch of things that don't make that much difference. I mean, it's all about leverage, right? Yeah, I don't I don't I think it's for anybody who basically works. You be a scientist, you could be a massage therapist, you could be a chiropractor, you could be a librarian. 8020 is all around you. It'll make you more effective at whatever you do. Yeah. Well, let's talk about 8020 as it relates to authors because we've got entrepreneurs listening to this who want to write a book and they're thinking, I need to write a book that's going to help me in my business. And they've got questions about writing the book, they've got questions about marketing the book. How would you guide this aspiring entrepreneur author through 80-20 sales and marketing in terms of them writing the right book and then getting that book out there? So I think this starts with you only write books that actually need to be written. You know, if there's five other books about the exact same thing, what's the point? Okay. And in fact, that is an application of the star principle, which is uh, one of Richard Koch's uh, adages um, that you you need to, whatever you do you need to be number one in a growing market. Okay, so let's say that you're a therapist and you've done what you've done for a long time, and you know that it's useful and you know that it helps people. Okay, great. 
right? And so you go, I'm going to write a book about this kind of therapy and I'm going to help people sort themselves out. Okay, that's great. But what most people try to do is the, they write a book that like tells everything they know. It's like they want to show everybody how smart they are. Well, the book you really want to write is the part of therapy that no other therapist has written a book about. And this, this is the big fish little pond principle all over again. So you carve off a slice of the market that nobody else is addressing. You solve a problem that nobody else is solving. And you build your identity around that one tip of the spear. Because that is really the only thing that's going to cut through the clutter. I mean, God knows we got enough books. There are so many books. Okay. And it doesn't mean we don't need new ones, but we don't need new ones that already got written five years ago. And this should come as a relief because it might mean that instead of writing a 300 page book, you only need to write a 35 page book. In fact, I just did this last year. I wrote a book called Detox, Declutter, Dominate. It's 36 pages. And it's a third illustrations and charts. Okay. So you can read the whole thing in an hour. Um, people need things to be broken down to be simple and easy. Like even the assumption that your book needs to be 150 or 250 pages, that is a very questionable assumption now. Like who, who wants a 250 page book if you already know that 80% of the value is in 20% of the book. Why do you even need the other 80%? In fact, the reason that my 36 page book is not 150 pages, I had written a 150 page book and my partner, Robert Scrobe said, hey Perry, um, send me your manuscript, I got an idea and I did. And two weeks later he says, I 80 20 your book. He's like, you didn't need 80% of this. I just, I chopped this down to what people actually need. It's 8,000 words now. I'm like, wow, I, I never would have done that myself. Maybe it was ego. Maybe just, you know, people have this idea about what a book is. Well, how do you know your idea of what a book is, is what you really should be doing? So, I mean, that book has done pretty well. And I'm, I'm very happy with it because... In 36 pages, I said what I needed to say. Funny, I'm going through this process right now because I'm creating a workbook for my audience, for these entrepreneurs who want to become authors. And the workbook is already 350 pages or something. And by the time I finish it, it's going to be closer to 500 pages. And I know that's way too long. So I started going through it and I started doing this 80-20 thing because I realized, you know, 80% of my audience just needs to write a book really quickly and easily. And they don't need to build an email list or a social media following or a website or all these other things that they can do. Now there's 20% of my audience, they want to do all that extra stuff. And so I started just dividing it and saying, okay, what do the 80% need? They just need to know, how do I get this book done? How do I get it up on Amazon quickly? And I don't need to do Audible. I don't need to do hardcover, just the paperback version. And Kindle because it goes along with the territory, but I just need to get that book out there. Mm -hmm. And I think by the time I'm done, I might just scrap the other 80% and say, you know what, let's just publish the workbook with that 20% and call it good because that covers 80% of my audience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, th and th see, that's true. And also, it's actually harder to write a 20% book because every word has to count. And you already know that four-fifths of this is going to get thrown away so that what's left has to be really good. So it's possible that it could take longer to write a 40-page book than it takes to write a 200-page book. But 
there's a saying which is easy reading is damn hard writing. Now, I'm not trying to intimidate people, but here's what I'm saying. If you do the work for the reader before they ever pick up the book, that's when they're going to like your book. Okay, you make it accessible. Um, most the, the world being the way it is with all of the social media channels and all the distractions and the cell phones and the texts and everything. Most people are not going to take the time to do any kind of a scholarly digestion of a large amount of material. It's just not like you can coulda, woulda, shoulda. Oh, they should. Fine. But they won't. That's perfect. Well, this has been great chatting with you, Perry, about your book career and the books that you've put out. What's coming in the future for you? Uh, I have a new book that is just coming out right now called Memos from the Head Office. And, um, you know, there are a gazillion books about. Got my copy here. Was this right. an advanced copy? Am I like a uh, privileged yes, here? that is an advanced copy. You're one of the first to get it. So one of the few. I've got it right here. In fact, the soft cover, as as we speak right now, it's still a couple days away um, in on Amazon. The the Audible and the Kindle just barely came out now. So there is a gazillion books about business strategy, and you should do this, and you should do that, but. There's a way that inspiration comes for a lot of businesses that is not any of those things. Like J.K. Rowling got the idea for Harry Potter as a mental download on a stalled train. And you can go read the story. She's like, I'm on a, I'm on a train and all of a sudden, here it comes. Like from somewhere. This is a book about that. And this is a book about cultivating what I call memos from the head office. And I just think it's one of the most underrated forms of wisdom in business. And it's got about 16 or 18 stories from different entrepreneurs that have like, this is how it happened. And uh, very unusual book. And I, I think people will find it very, very interesting. Yeah, and I haven't read it yet because I just barely got the copy, but you can look at this and you can say, well, that's God, or you could say it's the universe or some sort of inspiration that you've tapped into. You could say it's your subconscious speaking to you and putting this information together and delivering it to you or whatever. But it is interesting how many of these stories are out there. Even Stephen King, I was listening to an interview of him uh, a couple of years ago on NPR, and this is probably a guy that you would say is not being inspired by God in terms of his writing, right? And it doesn't <laughs> seem to align really with uh, anything we think about uh, a loving God. But uh, he, was, he was talking on this uh, interview on NPR about how every book that he wrote just came to him. He said it was just like somebody was putting it in my head. Mm. And he said that got turned off for a while. I can't remember how long it was. It was like 10 or 15 years or something that he could not write a thing. And then all of a sudden, one day it turned back on and they started coming into his head again. Mm. And so this idea of information coming into our heads as though it was coming from outside, from God or again, wherever. But that does seem to be a common idea with a lot of creative people out there who are producing a lot of interesting, influential work, even if we don't necessarily like all of it. But Well, the, the Greeks called it the muse. And when the Greeks talked about a genius, genius was not something that you were or had inside of you. It was something you were tapped into that was on the outside. Now, I think that's correct. I don't think, the, I don't think our best ideas come from ourselves. And I don't believe that we figure out our best ideas. Um, the guy, Mendelev, the guy who came up with the periodic table, it came to him in a dream. There's a crazy story of him having a dream about beer bottles or something. I mean, it's really kooky almost. And like the periodic table is like one of the most ingenious things in the history of mankind. I mean, is and if you understand chemistry, I mean, it is like really clever. Um, 
it came to him. And like, the thing is, is you don't have to sort out exactly where all this comes from in order to receive it. And I, I, that's kind of what you're alluding to. It's like, now, you know, I very much believe in God and I think that that's a, that is a part of it, but you don't have to believe the way I do in order to turn on that channel. That's great. Well, I think that's a good final message for our listeners here. Try to tap into that, whether you believe yeah. in God or whatever that is. I tend to believe in God too, but I know other people don't, but still there's something out there that you can tap into. Thanks so much, Perry, for being with us here on the show today. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? Um, go to perrymarshall.com and uh, just scroll down on the homepage. And there's, there's a course called the 30 day street MBA and it'll smack you in the face from the very first email. And uh, you'll know really quick if you belong in my world or not, just from reading that. Awesome. Read MBA, perrymarshall.com. Great. Thanks so much for being on the show today, Perry. Thanks, Josh. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star rating review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're an entrepreneur interested in writing and publishing a nonfiction book to grow your business and make an impact, visit publishedauthor.com for show notes for this podcast and other free resources. 